Action Group webinar, Consumer Perspectives in Dementia Research. Uh, my name is Edwin Tan and I'll be facilitating today's session. So it's great to see such a big turnout today. Uh, we have such a large audience, so we have a real mix of uh, people, different researchers, clinicians, people living with dementia, their families and dementia advocates. So thanks so much for joining in today. We have a really exciting program lined up. Um, we're going to hear from three ADF 2020 Public Travel Award recipients and their research partners about their experiences uh, working together on dementia-related research projects. So I think these are talks are going to be a really excellent opportunity to learn about the unique experiences and perspectives of being involved in dementia research and why it's important to include consumer community voices. So as you may be aware, our presenters were due to deliver their talks at the Australia Dementia Forum in Adelaide, which was actually meant to happen next week. However, ADF's been postponed, so we're now conducting this via a live Zoom session. So before we begin, uh, just some general housekeeping. Can you please make sure, firstly, that you have your video turned off and that you're on mute if you're not speaking? Secondly, if you have any questions, uh, can you please post these in the chat window during the presentation? These will be answered at the end of the presentation. If we're unable to get through all the questions during the session, then the presenters are happy to answer any questions you have offline. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So we're going to hear first from Bobby Redman and Linda Steele. So Bobby is a retired psychologist who, since her diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia in 2015, has worked towards improving the lives of people with dementia through her dementia advocacy work in the community. Linda's a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law at UTS and was the chief investigator on the Safe and Just Futures project which was funded by a Dementia Australia Research Foundation Victoria Project Grant. In their presentation, Bobby will focus on the different ways in which people living with dementia can become involved in research and what the benefits are to all parties when this occurs. Linda will introduce the project and its key findings. So thank you, Bobby. Um, you can share your slides and we can start your presentation. Thank you very much, Edwin. Um, Linda, if you could share the slides for me, please. Not quite there, but while Linda's finding that, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I'm Bobby Redman. Um, up until my retirement in 2014, I was a practicing psychologist. Um, in 2000, the end of 2015, I was diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia. And um, that's when things started to get really interesting. Um, just wait for these slides. So if you could move me on to number two, please, Linda. Thank you. Um, the presentation that I'm going to give today, or my part of the presentation, um, is covered here in this slide. So you can just basically see um, that I'm going to talk about why it's important to involve us um, at every stage of invention, invention of research, um, both before, during and after. And I'm going to give an example of good research that does just this. Next one, please, Linda. So at what stage should we be involved? Um, I'd say really we need to be involved at every single level. Um, it's vital that, um, that people with lived experience are involved um, all the way through. And this should start even before the decision is made about what's to be researched. Um, the quote you see here is from Sarah Tuckus, who's a renowned social researcher. Um, and as you can see, he's talking about if assistance experts are available, um, research can choose a more complicated issue to study. Otherwise, selection may be restricted to easily studied approachable issues. Now, what I'd like to remind you is that one of the best ways of gaining expertise in, in any area is to have insider knowledge. And um, one of the joys of having dementia is that we actually have an insider of, of knowledge of what it's like to, to live with dementia. And so, um, we are the experts, doesn't matter what our background is. 
Um, dementia is not a simple thing, um, but it's easily studied. Um, and, well, easily study aspects make it appear so. Um, so by getting into research, or in, research in a deeper way, we can make it much more meaningful. Next slide, please, Linda. There are many different ways for, for people to be with dementia to be involved. And these are the, some of the ways that I've been involved over, over the last few years. Um, so, you know, you can be involved as a co-researcher. Um, we can sit on steering committees, um, provide guidance in preparing materials. Now, um, often materials, um, can, it's just a matter of changing colours or changing the wording, um, using the right terminology for um, when you're talking about us. Um, and by we can review surveys and make sure that they're easy to read and understandable. Um, we can participate in pilot studies to iron out any potential issues before they go out to the, to the general participants. Um, we can participate, I've participated in product testing um, and then later on reviewed research. But they're just some of the ways, but there are many, many more and each one would depend on the type of research you're, you're completing. But sort of try and be imaginative and work out just how useful we can be at every stage. Um, next slide, please. Um, so after the research, it doesn't have to stop there. Um, basically, yes, I've mentioned we can review research and I've been involved in doing that. Presenting research, which I've also been involved in doing. Um, and in assisting to identify the next steps. Um, because sometimes we can say, yeah, actually that was really useful, but what we really need to know is this. So it kind of can move along from there. So um, some organisations um, provide, also provide funding for people with um, dementia to uh, review and judge awards for, for research, and I've also actually been involved at that. So at times there are opportunities to present aspects of the research and your involvement at conferences or forums like today. Sometimes there are even opportunities to present around issues relating to the main research matter, uh, which could lead to further expansion. Next slide, please. Now, sometimes there is an opportunity to be involved in a research project at multiple levels. And I'm going to tell you about one such project. Um, in 2018, I was invited to sit on the project advisory group for a research project titled Safe and Just Futures for People Living with Dementia. In all honesty, although I knew this could impact many people living in residential care, I have to admit, I was mostly interested from a purely selfish perspective, given the potential impact it could have on my future. As my goal is always to gain a greater understanding of the overall picture on dementia and dementia care, I was also interested in viewing the situation from a moral and legal perspective rather than from the more common human needs and, and care perspective. At that stage, I had no idea on how much my own thinking and awareness um, would be impacted by these human rights issues. Next slide, please. So the first stage um, was the advisory panel. Um, and um, very often you'll find that advisory panels are divided up. We have an advisory panel for people with dementia and then we have the experts on another one. Um, which is really quite frustrating at times because you don't get the overall picture and we're not sure how things are being discussed. So this was very stimulating. It was a mixed advisory panel. Um, so alongside people living with dementia and family carers, at researchers, doctors, lawyers, um, and care home professionals. Um, given that this was all before the start of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, my perspective had been slightly naive. Um, all of which over the length of time I was involved in this project um, changed greatly. Um, the diversity of the, of the pers perspectives provided such a wide range of knowledge that for me, and perhaps to the professionals in the team, I'd like to think, it was like looking at a jigsaw puzzle um, as pieces were added to form the big picture. Once this framework had been developed, it was time to move on to explore the perspective of stakeholders. Next slide, please, Linda. Stage two involved both individual interviews and focus groups with people living with dementia, care partners, care home workers, lawyers and advocates. 
I believe that many who were interviewed or who were part of the group had never thought of many of the restrictions placed on people with dementia living in residential care as a breach of human rights, um, me included, um, but more of something that happened um, that wasn't ideal but couldn't be avoided. It's amazing how much of a shift there's been in the past two years. Well, at least in thought, if not in action. Um, so many of the issues raised during the Royal Commission were identified and documented in this particular project. Next slide, please. As you're about to hear, the project didn't stop here. At the end of 2019, the research group organized a summit to present the findings of the research and to provide a forum for conversations about human rights and residential age care. I was pleased to be invited to present at the summit, which was also an opportunity to showcase the important and diverse work already underway by people living with dementia, care partners, advocates, lawyers and academics in relation to upholding the legal rights and human rights of people living with dementia who are in residential aged care. Um, although this is beginning to feel and sound like a television advert, there is more. Um, following the summit, all participants were invited to contribute to an anthology which became part of the submission to the Royal Commission. This, I believe, is a wonderful example of how people living with dementia can participate in research in a meaningful way at so many levels. <laughs> For me, who's always thought in terms of being a dementia advocate, I realized that the line between advocacy and activism is a very fine and blurry one. Can anyone be one and not the other? Now I'd like to hand over to Linda to give you the finer details of the research. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. I'll just be one moment getting the slides up. Is that on the screen? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, um, yeah, thank you for the invitation to Bobby to present alongside her and to Alicia and her colleagues as well. Uh, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the um, Wadi Wadi people of the Darwell Nation upon whose ancestral lands my house stands where I'm presenting from today and acknowledge that um, many of us here today will be situated on um, the country of uh, many different Indigenous Australian nations. Um, so I'm just going to provide a bit of an overview from a chief investigator perspective on the importance of having of um, researching with uh, people living with dementia and also provide you a bit of an overview of the um, of the project findings. So uh, this project was funded by a Dementia Australia Research Foundation Victoria Project grant. Um, and the project, uh, the project was funding an early career researcher grant. So it was an opportunity for me as uh, an academic who um, had uh, research and previously uh, lawyer uh, experience in relation to uh, intellectual disability and disability more broadly, to be able to develop my knowledge and research in relation to people living with dementia. And I should say that the reason why I applied for the grant and got interested in this area was due to uh, being a participant in a research project run by Lynn Phillipson at University of Wollongong and Kate Swaffer. And they were looking at uh, ways in which you could uh, integrate uh, learning about dementia into all aspects of the university curriculum. And Kate and Lynn came to speak with me in my office for the interview. And it was really the first time I had ever uh, really considered people living with dementia as a specific population of uh, people with disability and really started to think about the significant human rights uh, issues that they face, particularly living in residential aged care. And I've done a lot of um, advocacy and research looking at the use of restrictive practices and uh, incarceration of people with intellectual disability and mental illness um, across the disability 
service systems and criminal justice systems, but I hadn't actually uh, thought about uh, the situation of people living with dementia. So this um, project and the funding was a really important opportunity to learn more about this area um, and also to work uh, alongside people living with dementia. So the research team consisted of uh, Richard Fleming, who is a um, professor in uh, dementia care, uh, Lynn Phillipson, who works in public health, uh, and Kate Swaffer, who is an international advocate uh, for people living with dementia. And we were also assisted by Ray Carr. Uh, and as well as the research team, we had a project advisory group that Bobby mentioned that included uh, people uh, from a wide, a wide range of different groups of people that um, are involved in or impacted by the um, focus of the research. So the project came about, um, well, firstly, because um, I was made aware of, of these important issues by Kate Swaffer. And so there's a kind of long-standing and growing human rights activism by people living with dementia uh, about the circumstances of um, individuals in residential aged care. Um, as well as this, over the past five years or so, we've seen kind of growing political uh, and public recognition of the circumstances in residential aged care. So uh, there was a Senate uh, inquiry about five years ago, four or five years ago, into indefinite detention of people with cognitive and psychiatric impairment. That was generally more focused on people with intellectual disability and mental illness in um, prisons and group homes, etc. But it did raise the issue of um, the situation of people in aged care facilities as well. We also had the Oakton scandal, which kind of really highlighted the um, uh, systematic use of restrictive practices, uh, as well as the lack of um, oversight and, and the lack of kind of community uh, knowledge or, or interest in these issues. And then more recently, we've had the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. Uh, and on the flip side, perhaps some possibly more positive developments in terms of aged care regulatory reforms that um, are attempting, look to be attempting to bring more focus on dignity uh, and uh, choice into uh, the provision of aged care services. So, the, um, so our starting point then in doing this project um, was more broadly the circumstances of people uh, in aged care, but uh, in light of the particular expertise we had on the project, uh, particularly with Richard Fleming, uh, looking at uh, environmental design of aged care facilities and also the long-standing advocacy of Kate around um, kind of looking at um, aged care facilities as having um, characteristics that make them in many ways similar to prisons or other places of confinement. We thought we would focus specifically on the environmental design of aged care facilities. So for example the ways in which aged care facilities typically have locked doors and gates, they are are spatially arranged in a way to have separate units that um, uh, congregate people living with dementia. And while these, we thought that while these um, aspects of aged care facilities and the very existence of uh, large scale facilities to house people have been quite uh, taken for granted uh, and just assumed to be the kind of um, background context in which specific harms or injustices might occur, we were interested in turning our focus to that built environment itself and asking uh, to what extent can we uh, reassess the built environment itself as particularly uh, giving rise to injustice or harms. So we were looking, we focused on two questions. What were the current barriers to liberty and community access for people living with dementia in residential aged care facilities? And then secondly, uh, could we utilise a human rights framework to transform the living arrangements of people uh, living with dementia? Um, so around the same time as the project began, uh, there was uh, a uh, call for submissions to the terms of reference for the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. So, uh, I made a submission on behalf of our project team, emphasising the importance that human rights and specifically the UN Disability Convention be included in those terms of reference. The draft terms made no reference to human rights, which was deeply concerning. Um, thankfully, the subsequent uh, terms of reference do include um, specific reference to disability 
for human rights. So we haven't necessarily seen a focus on that in the, um, the aged care um, reports or uh, hearings. Uh, okay, so we began by kind of constructing a framework where we identify particular human rights that might be relevant to looking at aged care facilities as um, unjust in terms of the way they're designed and laid out. Uh, and then we then brought our advisory group together uh, and we had a meeting with Bethany Brown, who runs the Older People's Advocacy at Hum the International NGO Human Rights Watch, to um, talk about how we might strategically position our research in order to contribute to the um, advocacy that was happening in Australia and internationally uh, about uh, people living with dementia and aged care. We then um, conducted focus groups and interviews, as Bobby said, and I have to rush along a bit now. Um, and we recruited very widely uh, via advocacy organisations, service providers, etc. Uh, and you'll see there that um, in terms of who we were able to recruit to participate, um, we were fortunate to have five people living with dementia. We would have liked to have spoken to more people, but uh, it was difficult to uh, find people who um, were happy to participate in the research. Uh, once we collected all our data, we then organised a summit, uh, as Bobby mentioned. And the reason why we did this was because what really came out in the research and through the advisory group meetings uh, was the the fact that um, you know there was a lot of um, there was a lot of interest in a human rights framework, but people didn't necessarily know a lot about what this approach might be, or didn't necessarily um, have there weren't necessarily a lot of conversations already taking place around human rights. So the summit was an opportunity to bring people together uh, from uh, people living with dementia, advocates, lawyers, academics, etc to be able to uh, discuss these issues together. And then we subsequently uh, published those um, uh, papers from the summit in an anthology which is available online. And once our articles in the next few weeks are finalised, we'll then be submitting, uh, making a submission to the Aged Care uh, Royal Commission. And these are some of the scribe images from the, from the summit that show, I guess, the kind of variety of views that were um, uh, shared at the summit itself and a number of the complex issues that were discussed. Um, I, I might just quickly skip along. I did have some slides on the key project findings, but I'm happy to share the slides with Alicia so that people can have a look at those later. I guess the key thing that came out was that um, confinement and segregation is happening through the aged care environment itself, but it's also happening uh, through less visible uh, means. So also through the um, lack of access to um, activities, the, um, uh, the apprehension that if people are taken out into the community, they will be discriminated against or excluded, so therefore they're not taken out at all. Uh, also that when people do with dementia do try to express um, their wishes to leave aged care facilities or to um, resist some of the control that's exercised over them that is seen that's pathologized and can result in further restrictions. Uh, so in thinking then about whether people supported a human rights perspective, we found that there was um, a lot of support across all of the um, participant groups for taking a human rights approach to this issue. But it was there were a number of barriers that people identified where they thought that in practice, human rights might not actually be uh, possible. And so from that, we've kind of concluded that you know, it's really important to keep on raising awareness about human rights uh, within aged care, uh, but also to, you know, be, be setting a very ambitious uh, agenda of actually, um, you know, starting a conversation about deinstitutionalisation of the aged care system in the same way that we've seen in terms of disability and child welfare systems. So just to finish up, in terms of the importance of um, having or researching with people living with dementia. This was really important for a human rights project because as I mentioned in relation to Kate, but now um, with in people like Bobby as well, they are the leaders in dementia human rights advocacy and by reason of their lived experience, they have really important critical insights in terms of dementia itself and also um, the social experience of um, dementia as well. Uh, and also the Disability Convention itself emphasises the importance of equality, non-discrimination and inclusion, and that shouldn't only be in the way that services are provided or um, how people are treated in our legal, in our laws, but also should flow through to how research is practised as well. Uh, 
Also, um, the importance because particularly dementia, as with other cognitive impairments, has conventionally been seen as removing people, um, denying people their ability to um, express their own opinions and to be recognised as legitimate knowers and, and recognise them as um, having autonomy over their lives. Um, in, involving people living with dementia in research as, as um, research partners and um, participants and advisors, etc., can itself be a form of epistemic justice where we are um, redressing that historic wrong of people living with dementia being positioned as um, incapable and um, uh, dehumanised. Uh, and lastly, uh, just to flow on from that, um, we should, particularly in a human rights context, human rights have uh, historically not actually um, adequately recognised the equal status of people living with dementia. So it's important in trying to shift human rights to be um, uh, tools that can be used to achieve people's uh, equality to actually involve people living with dementia in that research and advocacy as well. Uh, so I might finish up there, um, but I'm happy to take any questions or emails after. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Bobby, Bobby and Linda. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I see in the, uh, the chat window, I think we have a comment from Catherine Paulette, which I might just read out briefly. Um, Catherine states, um, I think we often disallow the person with dementia of having emotional responses. So norm normal emotional responses such as frustration, etc., as they may not be able to express these emotions in socially acceptable ways. So that's a very important comment. Uh, do you want to comment on that at all, Linda or Bobby? Um, oh, you go, Bobby. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, look, yeah, I have, have to agree, Catherine. Um, I, I think it's interesting that um, everybody, it doesn't matter with or without dementia, gets angry or frustrated or irritated from time to time, but when it happens, um, for us, it's described as challenging behaviour or in, inappropriate behaviour um, and often punished by either um, shutting us away or by um, feeding us drugs to keep us quiet and stop us getting angry and frustrated and irritated. Uh, of course, yes, the feeling... Yes, I not, agree. The, yes. The feeling doesn't it's, go away. It's, it's crazy. You know... You know, any of us can have a bad day. Any of us can, um, you know, need to express our emotions. And we all do that differently. And, you know, I think when you can't, you know, perhaps just turn around and say, I'm having a bad day or can you please stop that? Or I can't cope with the overwhelming stimulus in this environment. When a person isn't able to advocate in in a manner that another person can easily respond to we we tend to um, not acknowledge that frustration and the manner in which it's expressed um, and it 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 gets labeled as aggressive it gets labeled as um, challenging behavior and it may be those things but we also have to label it as a normal human response to stresses that that this person has an absolute right to express and it may be that we need to be more tolerant of the the manner in which this person needs to express that because if we can't um, express ourselves in response to our environment then we all become ill you know, we, we, we internalise these responses. And sometimes the only thing a person has left is to say, I don't like it. I'm not happy. And we need to say, I hear you. And we can say that by, you know, telling them. We can say that by trying to remove the, the unpleasant stimulus. We can say that by therapeutic touch. But we must let the person express their emotional response to the situation. Thank you, Catherine. Those are some excellent points. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, in the interest of time, we might just move on to the next presenter. But if you have any further questions for Bobby or Linda, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. So, 
The next people we'll be hearing from are Kathy Roth and Anita Go. So with a background in both health and business and currently completing a master's in leadership, Kathy has held a number of non-executive directorships on not-for-profit organizations and government boards and ad hoc planning committees and has received business, rotary and community recognitions, including a Medal of the Order of Australia for services to the Geelong community. The diagnosis of her surgeon husband, John, with Alzheimer's disease five years ago, led to Kathy establishing POWs, Professionals with Alzheimer's and Related Diseases, to give high functioning people with dementia ongoing intellectual and peer stimulation and an opportunity to contribute to research projects, including the current PITCH project with research fellow, Dr. Anita Go. Dr. Anita Go is a clinical and research neuropsychologist. She is a research fellow at NARI and works clinically at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. She's also a research fellow at the University of Melbourne. All right, uh, over to you, Kathy. Uh, so I'm starting and setting the stage for Kathy just by introducing the pitch project and explaining some of that design. So it's a co-designed project where um, we've got a big team of investigators who you can see there and it's funded by the NNIDR. So this project essentially is co-designing an education program a dementia specific education program for home care workers. So the people that go into the home um, in the community and help people prom promote their independence at home, if that's showering or cooking um, or cleaning and things like that. So we know that they typically don't have that much specific dementia training. So what this project um, aims to do is to get together with people with dementia, get together with family carers and also the home care workers and the service providers to figure out what these home care workers should know to provide quality care for people with dementia. So this is, these are some of our co-design workshops um, where you know all those three stakeholder groups are in the room deciding what should be in this program and what's important for people to know. And you can see down here in the pitch training program here, the five learning objectives that they came up with in the co-design um, was understanding their vital role, understanding, you know, dementia, but also the lived experience and the impact um, and really how to apply that increased understanding to how they practice um, their role, their really important role and in terms of supporting family carers um, and also improve their own experience of being a frontline healthcare worker. So just very quickly to date, we're still in the middle of the big randomised control trial to test this program to see whether it works and is economically viable. Um, we've done the assessments with 158 home care workers and 30 client and carer groups, and we've given 11 dementia training workshops to 94 professionals um, across two states at the moment. Um, and we've got six service providers involved across three states of Australia. So Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. So the ethos, I guess, of PITCH, because it is a co-design project, is to collaborate with the people who the research affects, to co-design the product that we're eventually getting out there. Um, and so it's co-created together. And one of the big parts of this co-design story is our project advisory group. And here's a picture of our project advisory group with Kathy and John in the front there and some probably some familiar places faces to you. So this involves um, roles to do with project government, governance, the project direction and development. It ensures the project is carried out respectfully. They advise on policy and the practical implications. They help us you know, talk about the project um, and the project outcomes. They see all the documents that we put forward and they provide feedback and advice on those and they also co-present and co-author with us as well on academic and non-academic outcomes. So um, we meet quarterly at least and then have email contact in between. We also find it really important to build in a budget for our project advisory group from the outset so we can pay people for their time and kind of acknowledge that their input is valuable um, and to 
kind of hit these points of why we're doing co-design in the first place. So we want our research to be relevant um, and we want our co-design to lead to enhanced outcomes. We want to improve the quality of services. And basically we want our research to mean something in terms of the real world. We're doing this research not in a you know, ivory tower vacuum, it's to help the people living with dementia. So there's lots of benefits for us and um, as researchers and I think for, for the people who sit on the PAG and for the people who will eventually hopefully benefit from this program. Um, it brings together lots of diverse opinions, it brings together lots of expertise including the people you know who have the lived experience. It increases people's skills, um, it improves you know the policies as I talked about the work. For me it makes it really meaningful so if I'm sitting on a you know, advisory group where I'm talking to the people who I'm trying to influence outcomes, it makes it much more meaningful if I'm able to talk to people directly about, you know, what researchers should look into and how. Um, and also the relationships that we've developed have been really strong, really meaningful, and I think really lasting. Um, here's some photos of us at a, a lunch at, a, at Melba's house with listening to opera together. Um, so I think my last point is, you know, we kind of, the principles of nothing about us without us, which came from the disability advocacy move, movement and, you know, is now um, being used in the dementia research area is basically what we're trying to do with our co-design. So over to Cathy. Thanks, Anita. Um, Anita has mentioned that um, the project is still underway, so we can't report on the outcomes as yet. And Bobby referred to the importance of the involvement in of uh, those with dementia in co-design of um, various projects. Linda followed that up um, with the the importance of the respect for for those who are involved. So my perspective this morning will be more on we are one of the the cogs in the wheel. Um, so perhaps I can tell you a little bit about PALS and how we came to be involved and hopefully what we bring to the project. Um, so not too long before the uh, establishment of the um, pitch research program by Anita and her amazing team, um, PALS was established. And it, PALS is Professionals with Alzheimer's and Related Dementias. And it came about due to the a lack of high level intellectual and social stimulation available to my husband, uh, John, who had been a surgeon and uh, was subsequently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. He went along to um, an occupational therapy session and was given a ball to roll down a butter. And he rang me and asked me, would I come and bring him home so that he could resume watching the Stephen Hawking analysis of the universe that he had been watching previously. Thanks, Anita. Um, so why is PALS um, focused on professionals? Well, it targets those from high functioning roles who've had a diagnosis of, of dementia and that diagnosis has compelled them to cease working, whether it's from a governance perspective or from the complexity of the work involved causing them to feel ineffective or unsatisfactory. Um, but the reality is that despite still feeling and often highly intellectually competent, this group of diagnoses have been discarded from the workforce. So thanks, Anita. 
Um, since they've been in such high functioning roles, roles such as medical specialties, law, corporate leadership, engineering, academia, um, corporate uh, executive positions and international boards, um, the peer interaction is integral to their social connection and the withdrawal of that interaction leads to severe social isolation and um, very often lack of intellectual stimulation as a kind of apathy sets in. Powell's through, uh, through corporate presentations in a boardroom setting um, provides that social and intellectual stimulation. And we see it as essential to the well-being and uh, ongoing high function of those with high level capabilities, um, despite their diagnosis of um, mild cognitive impairment or of early dementia. Thanks, Anita. The group was established in Geelong, but following requests from others who'd heard of our activities, we now have groups in Geelong, Melbourne, Sydney, Batemans Bay, uh, one in the UK, and just prior to coronavirus, um, we're about to establish a group in Ballarat and another group in Canberra. So they'll move into next year. And we did this through um, establishing the organisation with the board and establishing standard operating procedures so we're able to provide consistency. So the pitch program in looking for a broad cross-representation on its advisory committee um, invited John and I to join. John as a person diagnosed with uh, dementia, myself as uh, an observer, a carer, and as um, chairman of Powell's. And it's been an excellent partnership. Uh, the pitch program is an outstanding one and Anita and all involved are really to be highly commended. Ensuring that the needs of those receiving care are met in a way that actually satisfies those needs seems such a simple concept. But when those needs are not able to be enunciated clearly, it makes the role of carer highly challenging. Thanks, Anita. So through our Powell's attendees, John and I are able to give significant input from those who are still based in their homes. And they're at a stage of just starting to need support. Their background enables them to be objective and analytical about their needs and to provide feedback of those needs. And to be able to be reassured, both for those diagnosed and their families, that the carers coming to the home are adept and well-trained and understanding the needs and communications is a huge um, relief for them. And while sadly we hear of stories where care in the home failed to meet the needs of the people needing care, most people we've spoken to through our PALS groups um, wish to remain in their homes. They point out that if those coming to their homes are well trained, families no need have no need to seek entry to early care. Uh, instead, they feel confident that the care being offered in the home is ideal for their particular needs and for the current stage of the disease progression. They've been able to indicate those things that make them feel uncomfortable and those things that make them feel valued as human beings. And feedback from the carers we've spoken to talks of the relief of being able to understand 
how to deal with the specific changes of dementia whilst efficiently and effectively managing the care activities of their role. So the strengths of working with Anita and her team on the PITCH program have been numerous. It's been a sharing of knowledge rather than the presenting of a viewpoint as we've all worked together towards a common goal and a successful result. Each has learned more of the other and the result in mutual respect and friendship is one that will be long and, and always treasured. The bonus is that coming in to care for dementia diagnoses in their home, that they'll be able to feel confident and comfortable in meeting the practical needs of the diagnosee as an individual, whilst those diagnosed and their families will have a great sense of trust, understanding and personalisation of that care. The PITCH program is a true win-win-win for all involved. And from PALS um, professionals with Alzheimer's, we thank you, Anita, for involving us and for initiating this program in the first place. Thanks very much, uh, Kathy and Anita, for that excellent presentation. Um, it's really exciting to see um, your involvement and, and the things that can come about from this sort of partnership with, with, um, between those living with dementia and, and um, the researchers. So I'm just looking at the chat window. There are a few questions. Um, due to time, we might just pick one to go through. Um, I'm sure Anita and Kathy are happy to take um, questions yeah. offline. Um, so let's have a quick look. Um, so. Um, so Ashley asks, well, she states firstly, wow, what a fantastic project, Anita and Kathy, well done. Um, have you thought about bringing consumers or community members onto supervisory panels with students, etc.? And Ashley, you to want to? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so we, only ha we have one PhD student on this project at the moment um, who currently doesn't have a, hasn't I mean, she's only got her, an academic panel, so she hasn't put together her um, main panel. And we are also seeking another PhD student to work on a triad tool to work out, you know, optimal relationships between the family carer, the person with dementia and the home care worker. So that's an excellent idea, Ash, that, um, that people would sit on that PhD advisory panel. Great, thanks for that, Anita. Um, there are a few questions, so feel free to maybe, if you wanted to respond to some of those, Anita. And, and oh. Yep. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next speaker in our webinar. So we're next going to hear from Trevor Crosby. So more than three, for more than three decades, Trevor Crosby and his wife, Jill, ran a farm in rural New South Wales and two other businesses. Trevor was also a long-serving member of a committee that manages water resources in central New South Wales and is an active member of his local golf club, serving as president of the club for three years. In 2014, at the age of 65, Trevor was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. Since then, Trevor has managed to fill the gaps he discovered with things like golf, yoga, sailing, and doing work for Dementia Australia. Trevor is currently part of a peer support program funded by the University of Sydney. He also speaks at advocacy and engagement events and also writes about his life experiences as a person living with dementia and about how dementia changes you. Trevor Crosby was recently called as a witness for the Royal Commission into Aged Care, Quality and Safety, Special Hearings on Dementia in Sydney. He spoke extensively about his experiences as a person with dementia, from his diagnosis five years ago to his frustration in accessing services and the importance of Dementia Australia's Living Well with Dementia support programs. He now lives in Sydney where he volunteers regularly as a dementia advocate with Dementia Australia, sharing his experience and expertise as a person living with dementia. So thank you, Trevor, um, over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, I'll move straight into it. Um, so far, so good. 
Um, sound body, strong dimension mind. Um, that really sums it up nicely, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about. So, um, collaboration with people with dementia needs to occur throughout the entirety of any research into dementia. Um, as a person living with Lewy body dementia, I have um, collaborated in many research pro pro projects as a participant and as an advisory group member. These um, research projects have included universities of Sydney, New South Wales and Newcastle. So my philosophy since my diagnosis in 2013 has been to actively engage in research, otherwise a cure will not be discovered. It's a very important fact. I'm very happy to share my experiences of this research project with Michael Linskip today. Michael, the founder of the PRIDE project, PRIDE being promoting independence in Lewy body dementia through exercise. This is a trial consisted of eight week, an eight week period of waiting, followed by an eight week intervention targeting progressive resistance and balancing training. The PRIDE research project has resulted in an increased understanding of this lesser common form of dementia. Lewy body disease affects over 100,000 Australians with Lewy body's dementia and Parkinson's disease sitting within its spectrum. Michael Enderskip's project included an exercise regime, both physical and mental. That led participants to improving their quality of life, my mental and physical health and strength dramatically improved from participating in the PRIDE research project. There are four distinct benefits from this collaboration. Uh, one, my own personal gain. Two, gains to other people living with dementia. Three, gains for the researcher and the PRIDE project. And four, broader gains to dementia research throughout, through practices of collaboration between people with dementia, researchers and academics, and further collaboration with other stakeholders including government and other agencies. My own personal gain um, in more detail, uh, initially I, I thought it was going to be quite a diff difficult eight weeks. However, the design of this program was structured around incremental results, which were manageable and attainable. I had numerous positive gains, including increases to physical endurance. I had no experience in weights and gyms before, before this, beforehand. Um, increases in physical strength, my leg press strength improved by 20% in the eight weeks. The, um, the program challenged my abilities requiring me to complete activities using coordination, balance, direction and mental cognition. An example of this was balancing whilst doing memory and pattern matching tasks. This combination of multi-skilling and multitasking exercises increase my confidence and capacity. Here I was, heel toe, heel toe, heel toeing, 
balancing a tray with a full cup and saucer, counting backwards from 100. A male multitasking? Who'd have thought of that? Well, it happened. Um, I have improved my cognition. Participation in this study introduced me to the link between physical training and improved cognition. My overall cognition improved during the study and I maintained this improvement by continuing to follow this program. I have embraced the techniques of the trial to maximise my health and beyond duration of the beyond the duration of the study, I have improved fitness, improved comprehension, improved memory, confidence and well-being, which I gained from my involvement in the program. And again, as to the other people, the results of this study highlighted the importance of physical and mental exercise for people living with dementia. My results help, help to dispel the myths about what exercise programs are for dementia. Balloon games and bingo are not rigorous enough for all people with dementia. We, those with dementia, can achieve much more and must be given the opportunity to do so. The results of this study on exercise and improved quality of life are accessible to all people with dementia. This is not this 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 is a non-pharmaceutical model of improving quality of life for people living with dementia. It doesn't have the costs attached to pharmaceutical models and a significantly greater success rate for participants. My participation demonstrated that exercise programs can be considered the most individualized medicine you'll ever have. As it can be specifically tailored to you, your condition and specific outcomes and the benefits for the um, researcher and pride. My actual participation and results, the remarkable results I achieved, provided insights for the researchers that were beyond their aims. My enthusiasm for dementia advocacy. I've shown the researchers that the importance of collaboration and different opportunities through the advocacy I do. I can share my network, including peak bodies, my peers who live with dementia, politicians and other researchers. Videos from the trial are used by undergraduates and postgraduate students for education and further research. Mike Linskip has developed a new syllabus based on findings from the Pride research at his new post at James Cook University. Now we'll watch a short clip that showcases the Pride project and the collaboration between people with dementia and the researchers. Here's the uh, commencement. There's no, no volume there. Take a nice deep breath in for me. Breathing out. One, two, three. Fast, 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 fast. Good. Last year I was involved in the study for eight weeks. One of the best things that ever happened to me, by the way. So just make sure you're waiting for that bell in between sets. I really had no experience in weights and gyms and those sorts of things. How about nice and slow, nice and slow, nice and slow. 
for the high intensity power training, resistance training in Lewy body dementia. It's kind of, um, they have Parkinsonian features, which is quite similar to Parkinson's disease. As a result, the use of cues such as bells and, and tapping on the muscle and asking the patient to push faster and, and harder, that's quite necessary to evoke a maximum response. Push, 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 push. Good. What we did was basically take the most robust kind of weightlifting exercise that you can do, which is power training at high intensity. So that's lifting heavy weights fast. Good. Now coming back in nice and slow. Breathing back in. That was a fantastic set, Graham. Unbelievable. So the amount of weight he just lifted was 270 kilos on the leg press. Shaking seems to have gone. It uh, has made life more enjoyable without the need to take some sort of drugs. Graham and Trevor's case, we saw quite a remarkable improvement in some measures of cognition, especially in executive function, which is known to kind of respond to exercise, and that's kind of the decision-making ability, which is quite important in maintaining independence. Cool, 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 cool. Good. Hold it in. Go back in. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. We'll move on. Um, broader benefits to dementia research from collaboration. Um, I feel very enthusiastic about open source research. The benefits for open source models and research and collaboration, speedier outcomes and reduce costs. The PRIDE study has been published with open access and I commend this approach. Collaboration extends further than the sphere of research. As a person with dementia, I can share first-hand experience and the direct impacts of research for particular studies such as PRIDE and um, the projects of, uh, as well as more broadly broadly broad pro projects. I have spoken at state and federal parliaments, as well as numerous other events and functions. I was called as a witness to the um, Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety and shared the benefits of my participation in the Pride project on this platform. Collaborating with people living with dementia needs to occur at all levels. I was also involved in drafting the new aged care quality standards. There were 20 on this committee uh, representing different stakeholders. I was the sole person living with dementia and I brought all my uh, skills and and um, experience to the table, feeling this and the, and the inadequacy there of representation, including my participation into this, this um, research. We must remember that this is all about me and 459,000 people living with dementia in Australia. At the end of the um, the end of the session, um, the chair said to me, thank you for the presentation. Um, we we'll often forget about why we are in this room and what for and who benefits from it. I felt the speech was quite a revelation for some of those people. Collaboration must include representation for people with dementia at all levels. From research participants through to the board of directors. And I emphasize through to the board of directors. I have been involved in many media opportunities, including with the SBS Insight, as you've seen. To conclude, quality of life plans are more easily achievable unlike prevention and or cure strategies which do not have the same success rates. 
exercise, in my opinion, and experience uh, will improve quality of life for people living with dementia. I was able to apply the new strategies that increase my confidence and inner strength from the participating in the Pride, Pride project. All people living with dementia deserve to have the opportunity to participate in Pride or other such projects that consider their individual exercise needs and have the uh, benefit of improving their quality of life. The only improvement that I could uh, see that could be made to this research would be for it to continue, uh, supported by a nationally fully, re fully funded dementia plan. Collaboration must be a factor for all dementia research. If you do do this um, research without me, i.e. people living with dementia, it's almost pointless. Never a true word spoken. Thank you for this opportunity to share my personal experiences uh, of my so sound body, strong dementia mind, which I achieved through collaboration, particularly with Michael Inskip and the Pride Project. Thank you. Thanks so much for that excellent uh, presentation, Trevor. It's really insightful and it's really inspired me to go hit the gym, I think, to <laughs> of, um, uh, maintain a sort of physical health, um, especially through strength training, um, but also that sort of partnership you had um, working with Michael and the rest of the team, I think it really highlights the need to, for researchers to reach out and collaborate with those living with dementia. So thank you for highlighting um, that. Um, I see that the chat has, you know, exploded with a whole range of comments supporting um, your talk and, and the research that's going on. Uh, I might see if there was any sort of specific questions. I think a lot of it is, is really just showing um, support for the work that's happening. Uh, so we have some comments about the, the, the actual uh, program. So it's fantastic to see really specific adaptations for this level of exercise for different types of dementia. So that was from Lenore. Yeah. And um, uh, Bobby says that many of us need more than balloon games and jigsaw puzzles. Uh, please recognize that physical and mental stimulation needs to be targeted for this individual. So I think that you, you, you highlighted that in your talk. Um, so that was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot. Did anyone have any sort of specific questions for Trevor? Okay. Oh, um, so I have a question asking, where can we learn more about this program? So I think some people are quite interested in adapting this for themselves or people they know. How would they go about that? Um, well, there's many ways you could do it. One, finding out from, I could, um, from your local gym when they, when they reopen. Yeah. Um, stating that you're, as I did, um, a person living with dementia and can you just design a package for me? And um, I've become a bit of a showcase for their, their gym because of the way they've adapted their facility to, um, you know, we don't quite do the, uh, the balloons, but we do, do, do weights that are tailor-made to individuals. Um, mental and physical um, strengths are uh, acknowledged. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think th there's that. And um, I know that the founder of uh, Michael Inskip has just moved from uh, Sydney Uni to Queensland and um, is in the throes of putting together a syllabus 
um, that he can use in his um, teaching. No doubt that'll flow through to to uh, other states. So there might be a bit of a waiting game there. But if anybody was uh, interested in the contacts that I had, um, you can contact me for sure and I can pass that information on. Oh, that'd be really great. I think a lot of people would um, would like to do that, reach out to you and then maybe Michael as well to find out more about the program. And it's it's great to hear that you've found the gym gym staff are supportive of you as well in tailoring programs. So that's that's excellent. Um, so we have we have a few sort of general questions. So these are I guess directed towards all speakers um, and researchers. So um, from Ron Sinclair, two speakers and researchers. How do we achieve getting more people with dementia actively meaningful, meaningfully involved in dementia research? So do you guys have any sort of, I guess, tips for getting that sort of meaningful connections and meaningful involvement? Yep, Bobby? Edwin, yes. Um, look up Step Up for Dementia. Um, Step Up for Dementia is... Um, has been a research project and it's now a database that links researchers to people living with dementia um, and that should be um, a prime way of, of finding people to participate um, both as um, advisors and also as participants. Um, also contact people obviously like Dementia Australia who have links with many many people with with dementia who can be put, you can be put in touch with and also dementia alliance international which is an international group if you're looking for for people from around the world um, including australia so lots and lots of sources um, please yeah reach out don't think you just got to look around and um there's plenty of us out there um, you just need to do the looking thanks for that bobby so um, I see in the chat window, the Step Up for Dementia Research um, website is, is www.stepupfordementiaresearch.org.au. Um, so I'm sure going through that site, people can then um, get in contact uh, with the people over there. So thanks for that advice, Bobby. Um, did anyone of the other speakers want to sort of highlight any sort of key things that need to happen for uh, people with dementia to be involved meaningfully in research. No, I think I think you guys gave a really good um, overview. Um, so there's definitely a lot of things happening in the chat. Um, just um, because of time, we might need to uh, wrap this up soon. But I'm sure if you have any further questions or comments for any of our speakers um, today, I'm sure they're happy to be emailed and you can feel free to reach out to them. Um, but yeah, I just want to thank again um, all, all the speakers today. Uh, it was a very um, insightful uh, talk, series of talks. So I'd like to thank again Bobby and Linda, Kathy and Anita and Trevor. Um, so as a researcher myself, I think it's great to hear these sorts of experiences that those living with dementia and dementia advocates um, have working with researchers. And I think it really does highlight the importance of involving uh, consumers at all stages of the research process. Um, I think it's these sorts of partnerships that um, ensure these sort of successful outcomes of research and allow them to be sort of translated in meaningful ways. So thanks again to our speakers, but also thanks also to our lovely audience. I don't think I've ever hosted such a large webinar before. So it's really such a good turnout. And thank you so much for the excellent uh, questions and comments. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you got something out of today's session. I certainly did. Um, so that's it from us. So thank you once again and take care, stay sa safe and um, hope to see you at ADF sometime in the future. All right, take care everyone, bye.